Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a very good afternoon to our friends and colleagues in uh, Russia. Good evening to our friends and colleagues in, uh, in, in this part of the world, in East Asia. Uh, welcome to the first Eurasia Business Dialogue, uh, organized by the Institute for Emerging Market Studies and the China, Russia, and Eurasia Studies Center. Uh, my name is Donald. I'm the director of uh, IEMS here at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, today is the first of these uh, Eurasia Business Dialogues, uh, which I hope will become a regular uh, dialogue series uh, exploring policy as well as social economic issues that affect uh, the business environment, the economic landscapes of China, of Russia, and, and of Central Asia. Uh, today's topic is something which is of great interest to everyone. Uh, it's certainly caught the attention of economists, of uh, policy scientists uh, and of policymakers around the world. This on curbing capitalism, how is economic policy making in China changing? Uh, in today's dialogue, we will explore the extent to which uh, recent policy and regulatory changes in China uh, reflect uh, longer term shifts in China's business and economic landscape. Uh, we will also look at uh, the tra trajectory of the Chinese economy and its ability to make the trans is trans a transition uh, to a productivity-led, innovation-driven one. From a political science perspective, uh, we always say that a state which encroaches more extensively into the commercial realm also challenges our standard notions of a developmental state. Uh, that standard notion says that as the economy becomes more complex, uh, the public sector retreats and the market plays a more active role uh, in, in, in the economy. So to what extent do these uh, regulatory changes and policy changes represent a major shift in China's economic model? Or does it represent a major shift in China's economic model as opposed to a mere refinement? What, what do these changes imply for the future of innovation and entrepreneurship in China? And how do these various efforts to curb the excesses of capitalism affect China's near and long-term growth prospects? To address these uh, and other questions, we have lined up a very distinguished panel of speakers. I will introduce them in turn. Uh, first up, we will have Professor Kelly Sai, uh, the Dean of our School of Humanities and Social Sciences and Chair Professor of Social Science at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Next, I'll invite Professor Albert Park, who's on leave from uh, UST, uh, but until recently was Head and Chair Professor of Economics, Chair Professor of Social Science and Professor of Public Policy. Third, we will have Professor Wu Shun, who is Professor of Public Policy, uh, as well as co-director of the, of the China, Russia, and Eurasia Studies Center. And finally, last but not least, I will invite uh, Professor Ruben Anikolopov, who is Rector of the New Economic School in Moscow. Uh, uh, to, to our distinguished audience, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, uh, and I will surface them during the Q&A session at the end of uh, the remarks by our, our distinguished speakers. So to kick us off, let me hand over to Professor Kelly Sai. Uh, so, Kelly, fire away. Uh, Kelly, you should unmute yourself. Yeah. Apologies for that. I couldn't unmute myself when I was trying to share my screen. Right. Let's try that one more time. Okay. Apologies for that little glitch. Um, I'd like to thank Donald for inviting me to speak. I'm really honored to be speaking at the inaugural CREC IEMS Eurasia Business Dialogue and look forward to learning from my fellow panelists. Today, I'm going to start by discussing changes that have occurred in China's mode of political economy from a more conventional form of state capitalism to party state capitalism. Then I'll talk about the impact of these domestic changes on China's external economic relations, and then circle back to what all this means for private entrepreneurs in China. And I'm gonna leave the big question about China's growth trajectory to the economists on this panel who have more expertise than I do as a political scientist. Before we get into the current policy climate for private entrepreneurs in China, I, I'd like to take a step back to situate the context for why there's been a shift in China's model of political economy from state capitalism to party state capitalism. At the broadest level, most political scientists who study China would agree that the Chinese Communist Party's sense of insecurity about domestic social stability and regime durability 
has led it to implement practices that have had the unintended effect of leading to greater insecurity, both domestically and globally. The late 2000s was a turning point in the lead up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics with unrest in Tibet and Xinjiang and other destabilizing incidents. This was followed by the global financial crisis, which amplified the vulnerability of China's export-led growth model, and then a host of domestic problems, including growing inequality, rampant corruption among cadres, and high levels of debt by governments local governments and businesses also amplified this sense of vulnerability. During this critical juncture, there was considerable domestic ideological debate about the merits of the Chongqing model under Bo Xilai, which emphasized traditional values of Chinese Communist Party ideology and was really trying to undo the harms of Chinese capitalism versus the neoliberal Guangdong model that emphasizes market forces, greater liberalization, and engagement with global capitalism. Meanwhile, the international environment also contributed to the party's sense of threat as color revolutions swept Central Asia and the Middle East. And to top it off, Edward Snowden's whistleblowing in 2013 revealed that the US's National Security Agency had infiltrated Huawei's servers. The Snowden affair triggered widespread concern in China about the country's dependence on foreign technology for critical industries. Taken together, all this has led to a growing sense of domestic insecurity and threat mentality, which is expressed in a fundamental shift from focusing on economic growth to risk management and prioritizing regime survival. This isn't to say that Beijing cares less about economic development than it did during the th first three decades of reform, but rather that China's political economy has become securitized such that economic issues are increasingly elevated to the level of security ones, both domestically and internationally. The leadership sees the need for China to develop the capacity to engage in indigenous technological innovation in frontier industries, such as AI, semiconductors, nanotechnology, and robotics. And China's made in 2025 industrial policy targets precisely these advanced technologies to become more competitive and globally self-reliant. In case there's any doubt about how seriously Beijing takes national security, this slide shows that there are 16 types of security under the umbrella of comprehensive national security. And the party plays a central role in promoting all these types of security, including economic security, which um, was explicitly identified as a pillar of national security in China's 2015 national security law. For the last two years, I've been working on the concept of party state capitalism with co-authors Margaret Pearson at University of Maryland College Park and Meg Rithmeyer at Harvard Business School. So I just want to be clear that these are jointly developed ideas. Overall, the main manifestations of party state capitalism include party state encroachment on firms, blurring boundaries, functions, and interests between the state and private sector, and demands for political fealty from private and foreign capital. Now, state capitalism typically refers to state economic intervention or ownership of firms with the goal of promoting growth and bolstering geostrategic and or economic competition, especially in globalized industrial sectors. Party state capitalism is distinct from state capitalism because the regime's political survival is the overarching priority. Economic goals still fe feature prominently in state interventions, but regime survival has become the primary aim of economic policy. Since 1925, the, the CCP constitution has said that any entity with more than three party members should have a party unit. But in practice, there's been considerable variation when it comes to party cell construction in private and foreign invested enterprises. Under Xi's rule, party building and firms really expanded and the CCP reported that by 2018, over 73% of non-state firms had established party cells. Meanwhile, government officials have been given senior posts in some of China's best known companies, such as the automaker Geely and Alibaba. Under party state capitalism, we've also seen the expansion of state capital well beyond firms that are majority owned by the state in a process that Barry Naughton and others have described as financialization of the state. There are now state owned capital investment companies that invest in non-state firms to advance industrial policy goals and generate investment returns in important economic sectors. And these investments are, they generally take the form of state shareholding firms acquiring minority stakes, usually less than 3% in non-state firms through purchases on equity markets. And this practice totally exploded during the stock market crisis in the summer of 2015 when sell-offs suddenly erased the gains of the prior year in the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges as part of the bailout, the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission arranged for a national team of state shareholding firms to purchase over 1.3 trillion renminbi of stocks on both exchanges 
just between June and September to the point that these funds ended up holding half the shares of all listed firms. And this broad financial intervention, it wasn't about allocating capital towards growth ends, but rather about risk management and maintaining stability. One of the results of the financialization of the state is increasing ambiguity in determining the extent to which private firms are truly private. For instance, the state has introduced special management shares in tech firms, which are used as a way to monitor private enterprises. And since 2013, the state has also promoted mixed ownership, which enables private investors to acquire minority stakes in state-owned enterprises in the form of partial privatization, but it also allows state funds to take ownership shares in private enterprises. So by mid-2017, SASAC reported that mixed ownership had been introduced to over two-thirds of all central state-owned firms. And the political logic of this sustained ambiguity in ownership is really to tether ac economic actors to the state and to limit their scope for independent action with the motivating principle of mitigating risk to the party state itself. Another manifestation of the blurring of the public-private distinction is that private firms in China have assumed state functions to achieve other policy goals. Large tech companies have embraced the Xi administration's poverty alleviation efforts that surpass the expectations of standard uh, corporate social responsibility programs. Um, and so in this way, we see a merging between the party state and private enterprises in achieving certain public goals. Uh, Alibaba, for example, has deployed its Taobao e-commerce platform to develop rural product markets, and they're even funding road construction in rural areas. Uh, Country Garden, one of China's largest real estate developers, has supported modernization of agricultural cooperatives, and they even send so-called po poverty alleviation cadres to go live in the villages to earn the villagers' trust and understand their needs in a way that's very similar to the poverty alleviation work teams that are dispatched by the party state itself. And then private firms have also become key actors in supporting the state's domestic security objectives. The private tech sector overwhelmingly dominates the supply of hardware, technology, and information that comprise China's expansive surveillance apparatus. One of the implications of this blurring boundary between the state and private sector is growing pressure on private entrepreneurs. This is by no means a comprehensive list of Chinese tycoons who have been detained or arrested. The official reasons for these detentions include corruption, running mafia style gangs, picking quarrels and illegal fundraising, but there are likely political reasons as well, like when Ren Zhichang called Xi Jinping a clown for his handling of COVID um, and Anbang and HNA's reckless spending behavior, you know, they've they were called uh, gray rhinos posing systemic risk to the banking system. And then there are more recent cases of the party state's regulatory crackdown on Alibaba, DV, and Evergrande still has to serve as a lot of debt, even though China recently lowered the LPR loan prime rate to ease the pressure on property developers. A third manifestation of party state capitalism in contemporary China is the expectation of party defined political correctness, not just by domestic economic actors, but also foreign corporations that do business in China and in territories over which it claims sovereign authority. Some firms have been proactive in demonstrating political compliance by establishing party cells in their China offices. Goldman Sachs was one of the first Western investment banks to do so in Beijing a few years ago. And since then, a growing number of major foreign brands and organizations have been pressured to express contrition for various political faux pas, um, primarily relating to how Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Tibet are portrayed in their advertisements, websites, or social media. Um, businesses with significant stakes in the China market have also changed their discourse and behavior, whether due to direct pressure or self-censorship, and there are many examples of this. The net effect of all of these developments is a growing economic backlash against China and Chinese firms. My co-authors and I call this a two-level economic security dilemma. In the classic security dilemma in the study of international relations, the security dilemma refers to how state efforts to make themselves more secure have the unintended effect of making other states feel less secure, which can lead to a downward spiral of an arms race and heighten the risk of military conflict. In the context of China, we observe that efforts to stabilize its domestic political economy, as seen in the transition to party state capitalism, has similarly had the unintended effect of making other countries around the world feel less secure and suspicious of China's intentions. Economic interdependence with China has become a national security con concern in many OECD countries. So I'll just run through these pretty quickly. As a result, there's been heightened scrutiny of reviewing FDI from China. 
Uh, large Chinese firms are assumed to be extensions of the party state, regardless of whether they're state owned or not. And there are a host of new initiatives um, to manage the China threat, both in the US as well as uh, in, in the EU. So what does this mean for Chinese firms? There's, there's certainly some pressure in OECD countries to decouple from China, but just to take one sectoral example of surveillance, the actual impact of various import bans and export controls has actually been pretty modest on China's surveillance companies. Um, Hick Vision and Dafa, the two largest ones in China and in the world, are still selling to the civilian market abroad, and you know, they're only banned from supplying to government entities. And it turns out that relabeled Hick Vision and Dafa products have continued to be purchased by multiple federal agencies and branches of the US military, like Army, Navy, Air Force. So the global supply chain involving surveillance technology from China remains resilient for now. Meanwhile, Chinese surveillance firms themselves have expanded into non-OECD markets through the Belt and Road Initiative and the Digital Silk, Silk Road. Um, Hick Vision and Dahua supply nearly 40% of the world's surveillance cameras. Uh, their surveillance tech is being used in over 80 countries and over 70% of Huawei's safe city contracts are in a non-democratic country. So there's robust market demand for Chinese tech products beyond the OECD. And there are many governments in the global South that continue to welcome Chinese investment. Domestically, uh, private entrepreneurs have always had a challenging time in reform era China, especially when, especially small and medium enterprises when it comes to access to credit, navigating bureaucracy and, and so forth. But there used to be more scope for negotiation with local officials and ways to reduce transaction costs. And that space has shrunk dramatically. Uh, the pandemic clearly accelerated and deepened surveillance of the population through not just health code apps, but also the expansion of smart cities that run platforms, create collecting real-time data on everything from traffic conditions to crime, pollution emissions, and what street level bureaucrats are doing it's harder to bend the rules under such circumstances and officials have become much more risk averse. And then there's the growing number of crackdowns. Uh, some of them claim to be in the interest of common prosperity like antitrust and private tutoring, but other crackdowns seem to reflect the cultural preferences of senior leadership in Beijing. So it's hard to know what will be next. Crackdowns usually have the net effect of pushing activities underground and making entrepreneurs nervous about investing in new areas that could be targeted later on. I view the crackdowns on tech influencers, online gaming as rectifying measures in the lead up to the 20th Party Congress this coming November. It's showing who's boss and setting the tone for the party's program for the next five years. And finally, in terms of priority sectors, there's a shift away from consumer facing tech like social media and e-commerce towards investing in critical technologies like semiconductors, AI, and quantum computing. As big tech, like especially BAT, by, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent are reined in, there, there could be more space for smaller startups and competition down the road. But now all eyes are on whether China can become self-reliant in producing semiconductors while shifting away from its traditional suppliers in Silicon Valley, like Broadcom, Intel, Qualcomm, and whether household and corporate assets can be diversified beyond the property sector. Um, thank you. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other panelists and engaging in a dialogue with everyone. Mm, thanks very much, uh, Kelly, for that fantastic uh, big picture overview. Uh, I'm going to circle back to you and, and the big question I, I want to ask you, which is deliberately meant to be pr provocative, is uh, could we be reading too much intentionality and central intelligence <laughs> into much of what you described the Chinese party state as doing? Because many of the things you described, whether it's financialization of, uh, of, of, of the state, right, uh, are things that other heavily intrusive governments do, right? whether it's Singapore or South Korea, Japan did in the past. Uh, also, the, the blurred boundaries between state, state and private actors. Uh, could it be a reflection of the fact that you know, the private sector has got simp you know, you know, comparative advantage, has got uh, superior capabilities? And finally, on demanding political fealty and political correctness, uh, you know, also could we be reading too much into that? Uh, it, I, I don't get a sense that it is part of a larger plan to, to well, I, I could be wrong, but, but I, I'll let you think, uh, ponder over those questions. Uh, are we uh, assuming too much intentionality and, and, and a central plan behind all of these? Uh, but I think you've also set up very nicely the stage for Albert, uh, who's going to talk a lot more about 
what do all these regulatory changes and uh, what these regulatory crackdowns, do they have anything to do with common prosperity? And what, 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 what do they imply for the, uh, China's near-term and longer-term economic prospects? Uh, over to you, Albert. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be part of this event. Um, I've been a very strong supporter of the importance of the collaboration between HKUSD and uh, New Economic School and Moscow School of Management Skolkovo on the Eurasia uh, uh, work and the center. Um, so I, I just want to offer a few thoughts about the outlook for China's economy um, today and uh, some thoughts about the common prosperity agenda. But um, in thinking about the outlook and this uh, common prosperity agenda idea to think about the role of the state and how it's affecting both of those um, issues. Uh, and by the way, I, uh, Donald mentioned I'm on leave from HQSD. I'm uh, working at the Asian Development Bank and I need to just state the caveat that I'm here in an unofficial capacity. And so none of the things I say represents the views of the ADB. Okay, so um, if you look at the growth projections uh, for China and then other major countries, and I've also listed ASEAN, uh, the top five countries in ASEAN, you can see that China has actually fared pretty well through the pandemic. It was really one of the only countries in the world to uh, record positive growth in 2020, 2.3%. And it also recovered very robustly in 2021. So that where China is in terms of its GDP per capita is pretty close to where it would have been without the pandemic. So it's kind of caught up. That's also true for the United States and some Western economies. The US has achieved that by an extremely aggressive stimulus package. China has not done that. China really achieved it by uh, being very successful in managing the pandemic. Although there are now you know, issues about whether the zero COVID strategy will become a barrier to maintaining growth or not. And then you can see also Japan has uh, ha had a pretty hard hit and is kind of slowly catching up. Much of Asia, ASEAN as well, is probably um, next year, this year, I should say, 2022, will be still five to 10% behind where it would have been uh, absent the pandemic. Um, so China's done well. If you look at the current issues uh, that kind of are going to inform the outlook for the Chinese economy uh, this year and in coming years, um, one issue is that if China sticks to a very strict zero COVID policy when the Omicron variant is very hard to control, it could lead to widespread crackdowns and mobility restrictions, we've already seen some of that happening, which is going to be, uh, which is going to have a negative effect on economic activity in China. Um, one thing also that China did in responding to the pandemic, unlike previous crises, is it was very restrained in stimulating the economy. And I think that was a recognition that in past recessions, they would expand lending pretty quickly and in large volume. And often those funds would not always be used efficiently in the economy. They would find their ways into the property market and push up property bubbles. I think there's a strong intention to deleverage the property sector because of concerns of financial risk, but also because it's part of this common prosperity agenda that housing prices are viewed as uh, a, a big constraint for poorer households, middle income households, and they need to be controlled. Um, there was a lot of talk last year about the dual circulation economy in China, and it's increasingly been defined as improving or increasing self-reliance in a hostile world, especially in uh, the technology sector. Um, originally, when this uh, dual circulation idea was proposed, it was very balanced. It was kind of saying, we want to develop our domestic economy and rely on consumption more, but we still care about the external sector. We want to continue free trade and export. So it was kind of a win-win thing, but I think uh, it's the domestic part of the dual that is certainly getting more emphasis given the geopolitics. But I don't think it rules out China's uh, external engagement. Um, as uh, Donald mentioned and Kelly mentioned, China remains committed to innovation 
and high tech development. But it's a very much top down industrial strategy uh, approach. And uh, I think there's a lot of concern about whether uh, at higher levels of innovation, um, those types of approaches can be very effective um, in the sense that uh, they're not always targeting the really uh, innovative small firms that no one knew about. They're kind of steering resources to the state enterprises and to the winners. It will certainly produce achievements, um, especially in areas where they just need to catch up. But in terms of kind of new, really globally leading investment, I think there are still issues about whether the innovation system in China is designed in a way that can really unleash creativity and uh, in a competitive environment. And finally, um, uh, well, two more points. One is that, um, as I said, China has been very careful to continue to be a champion of multilateral trade openness. Um, I was part of a working group meeting for in preparation for G20 and the Chinese representatives really made an emphasis about emphasizing the importance of multilateral trade. Uh, China's also part of the uh, RCEP, the big Asia trade agreement, um, and is hoping that that will also uh, provide momentum for both its uh, outbound FDI investments, but its international trade. And we know about the Belt and Road Initiative, which of course has been slowed by the pandemic. It's been hard to conclude investments. And a lot of countries have had to uh, be much more careful about their investment spending, including China. Uh, but the commitments remain, and most countries uh, say they're committed to finishing the projects. Some projects have been curtailed, but not for the most part. And finally, in terms of the economic outlook, uh, you know, the regulatory storm, this is a term that Barry Naughton has coined to describe the summer of 2021, where we saw all these. Uh, crackdowns on high tech, on commercial tutoring. tutoring. And um, my, so uh, a lot of high level economic economists in China and government spokespersons have, have tried to make the, the point that these all had clear public policy rationales for high tech to deal with uh, security, data security issues, data privacy issues, and anti-competitive uh, concerns, which are all issues that uh, big tech is facing uh, in all countries around the world. Um, so it's kind of, you know, how do you want to view it? I, I kind of feel that how, whatever uh, take you have on it, one thing that was disappointing is that the way that it was implemented was really uh, sudden, unexpected. There, it didn't reflect, uh, People didn't know, anticipate there was no kind of dialogue, discussion, a signaling of intent to get everybody kind of on the, on, on the same uh, mindset about what was likely to happen. And there's a lot of research in economics which says that, which shows that it's really uncertainty about policy, which is hugely inhibiting for investment, not the actual policy itself, even levels of subsidies and taxes. Even the trade war, people are now finding there is much less trade, uh, there's much less uncertainty over the trade war in terms of it affecting uh, business decisions. People have basically accepted that the tariffs are here to stay and they're just going on with it and it's no longer a source of inhibition. But, but the regulatory, the way it was implemented, I think created enormous uncertainty. And I know friends in the private sector in China uh, feel, like they're not sure what's gonna happen and, and many of them are laying low. And I think it could really hurt uh, investment as Kelly mentioned in, in especially risky new areas, but even old areas, if there is a, is a concern that the regulatory uh, environment is going to be, could, could change dramatically. Uh, why would you make a long-term investment? Why wouldn't you focus on the short term? So I think those are all real issues which affect China's growth projection. So. My last slide is about the common prosperity agenda. So why has this become an uh, important um, direction for uh, China's leadership? So I, again, I think you can look at a lot of the issues in two ways. On the one hand, you can say, well, you know, they just realize inequality is really high in China. It creates economic and political risks. 
um, for, the, for the leadership. I think this is a, a line that I think uh, Kelly might support. <laughs> um, but also you could also just say, it's not so much that, it's that I think China recognizes the capitalist model of development uh, in the West hasn't worked very well, that you can see all sorts of social political problems there as well. And maybe, maybe the Xi government is just confident and is realizing its own vision of what it thinks high quality development should be or should be. Maybe it's a confident response as opposed to one uh, that's a response from weakness. But I, you could look at it both ways, right? And, um, but what is it in terms of uh, what they're trying to accomplish? The most recent rhetoric from Xi, for instance, at his comments at the Davos meetings um, last week, really emphasized the idea of fairness, social fairness, and that all citizens in China should share in the fruits of China's development. And you know, I think those are laudable goals. And one thing that many uh, Chinese leaders have 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 emphasized because of the cons they recognize the concerns. Um, that people are expressing is that this is not a return to egalitarianism. And they always use this phrase, we're gonna maintain the decisive role of markets in resource allocation. And yet it seems like the state role in many aspects of the economy seems to be increasing. Now, how are they gonna accomplish a common prosperity agenda? And I'd like to you know, remind everyone that inequality in China is higher than the United States, higher than almost all countries in the world uh, by most measures. And you know, China has uh, Forbes lists 83 of the top 500 richest people in the world are Chinese. Um, and it looks like from what we've seen that a lot of the approach is through expanded regulation. Um, and the problem here is that the things that, the measures that would most likely be able to fix income inequality or wealth inequality, which should be accomplished through government taxation and spending policies, that, that agenda seems very unclear. Uh, there's been some discussion of property tax reform. There has been repeatedly in the past, but no clear indication that they're going to move forward. And that is one of the key issues that underlie the regional differences and the regional inequalities in China and uh, individual inequality in China that their a property tax would really be progressive um, and accomplish some of the things that the Chinese government would, but there may be political goals, or you could take a more pessimistic view that they're not serious about it. They want to be perceived as doing something, but they don't actually want to accomplish it. And finally, um, despite all of these uh, measures, no one questions that the role of the state is leading in the economy. You can see right away there, there's a very there's a tension between this statement and the previous statement, maintaining the decisive role of markets and resource allocation. You know, I was part of a dialogue behind the World Bank's New Drivers of Growth report that came out a couple of years ago, and that report was delayed for a couple of years, mainly over uh, disagreement or discussion or negotiation about how to describe the role of state enterprises and what the reform agenda should be vis-a-vis -vis state ownership and private ownership. And I uh, compliment the World Bank because the, what they managed to put in the report, I think is all very good, emphasizing competition, emphasizing incentive reforms in state enterprises, um, and that these are really, really important for China's um, economic uh, performance going forward. Um, one thing that was obvious from the analysis uh, for that report is that China has, despite all of this innovation, uh, you know, tremendous number of patents, et cetera, China has experienced a productivity slowdown, whether you look at macro data or firm productivity data in the past 10 or 15 years. And some have presented evidence suggested it's related to a less open competitive environment. And that's certainly true for some of the high tech uh, service sectors as well. Uh, so anyway, let me finally finish with just a couple of uh, comments about the outlook for the common prosperity agenda. And again, I want to kind of try to be balanced. On the optimistic side, you could argue that the regulations create desirable limits on the market and a better life for Chinese citizens and do not necessarily undermine the market. And of course, you could be pessimistic and say that expanded state controls over the economy and society are going to undermine incentives, productivity, and growth momentum going forward. Of course, for all of these things, 
uh, things could change. So the jury will still be out uh, for as long as we continue, continue to follow uh, these uh, events. Let me stop there and give it back to Donald. Thank you. Mm, thanks very much, Albert. Uh, you know, similarly, I would throw an uh, 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 almost impossible to answer question to you. Uh, one of the Chinese defense uh, of uh, these regulatory crackdowns on, on big tech and other industries is that uh, you shouldn't conflate it with the common prosperity agenda. Uh, that has to do with redistribution, has to do with addressing inequality, and as you say, uh, improving social fairness. And with the regulatory crackdowns, that's driven by legitimate policy goals, right? such as antitrust regulation, such as data protection and privacy. So we shouldn't conflate the two. And, and in, in, indeed, in economic theory, we say regulating markets, you can regulate markets without, you know, that, that's a separate issue from legitimizing markets, right, about reducing inequality. Uh, and, and, and there's a way to do both intelligently without conflating the two. Uh, so again, are we overreading into, are, are we confusing the issue by uh, put, you know, talking about the very legitimate policy-driven uh, uh, regulations of big tech with the common prosperity agenda, which also has its own uh, logic and, 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 and uh, policy imperatives. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, for you to ponder, Albert. And, and I think it's a good time to switch over to Professor Wu Shun, who's indeed going to talk about uh, you know, the regulatory, regulatory uh, drivers and trends with big tech and what are the implications for innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, so over to you, Shun. Uh, thanks, Don. Uh, can, can I share my screen? I think now it's still uh, the still the shared screen by, by Albert. Albert, could you uh, unshare? Oh, your sorry. Yeah. Yes, let me unshare. Oh, what am I doing? Okay, there. Okay, let me, let me. Uh... Okay. Um, good, good evening, um, everyone, and uh, good afternoon for those of uh, you join um, uh, from uh, Russia and other parts uh, uh, of the uh, Eurasia. Um, so I'd like to uh, discuss a bit more uh, detail uh, in the regulation of the big tech and uh, um, Professor Tsai and, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Park already uh, uh, touched upon uh, some of the idea here. So I'd like to uh, provide a bit more context uh, and also and as a policy scholar, also I like to uh, look at some of the you know policy implications uh, of of that such regulation. So I like to uh, uh, use uh, these charts um, to illustrate the both uh, some of the regulation regulatory measure has been adopted so far, as well as the impact here. So um, you know this chart indicate. Uh, the, the Golden Dragon China Index, which is an index fund, uh, including some of the major uh, stock uh, listed in the uh, US uh, stock market. And if you look at uh, uh, the performance of the, uh, the index I, uh, over the last year or so, uh, there's really you know, significant uh, increase uh, in early uh, part of the last year, but then uh, there's a significant reduction uh, in terms of uh, stock market valuations uh, since then. Uh, there is more than US 1 trillion dollars of stock market values uh, have been wiped out um, uh, since then. Right? So, so if we look at some of the uh, main regulatory measures uh, have been uh, used by the Chinese authority uh, so far. Uh, so this can really, uh, you know, uh, can, we can look back uh, November uh, last year, um, well, November, yeah, uh, 2020, uh, 2021, uh, the year before, uh, looking at the ENS Group IPO uh, was uh, uh, suspended. And, uh, and then uh, in uh, February of 2021, China issued revised antitrust rules for internet firm. And uh, then, you know, uh, various uh, firm, um, the tech company uh, were fined uh, because of violations uh, related to Enter a monopoly investigation, and um, more recently, or not more recently, but six months ago, I think the China, China um, uh, issues um, a pretty uh, strict regulations um, after uh, DD uh, was uh, listed in U.S. stock market, and uh, and the China China order a local app store uh, to remove DD's apps. So so those are you know some of the key 
uh, would say in measures, uh, but there are also other measures uh, that have been adopted during the last year. So, so this uh, chart indicate uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, DD's uh, uh, stock uh, prices uh, change from the IPO uh, of uh, you know end of June um, 2021 um, to uh, most recently. If you look at uh, uh, there's a significant reduction at the beginning, 4.4 billions of uh, um, the funding uh, been raised through IPO. Uh, then a few days later, Chinese regulator ordered DD uh, app to be removed from the store. And then most recently, uh, early December, uh, DD announced uh, that it will uh, delist from the US stock market and uh, will consider uh, listing in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, stock exchange. So one of the um, first motivation for the uh, the regulation of uh, high tech or you know, uh, big tech in China uh, is to deal with the monopoly power uh, of these uh, big data company here, right? Because of the, the vast amount of data collected, they are able to engage uh, predatory uh, practices. In this particular instance, they are able to uh, raise prices um, to uh, the customers use their services more often than others here in Chinese called da su ju sa shu or cheating old friend with big data. Uh, so this is a, you know in, indicative of uh, um, predatory practices. And uh, the reason they are able to do that uh, um, is because of the vast amount of data uh, that they have over you know, a different aspect of uh, people's life, uh, consumptions and uh, medical care, a lot of different uh, uh, data that they have. And that allow them uh, to get into different areas of the economy here. And, uh, and because of that unique access to data here, they can also share themselves um, from competition uh, from uh, the rival uh, company. And uh, if you look at kind of market share of the tech giants, uh, this is really, uh, reach to the extent really uh, you would call uh, the uh, the monopoly powers uh, in in those different areas. This is in the in the case of uh, the e-commerce. Really, you look at uh, uh, you know some of the biggest companies have a you know significant share, close to eighty percent of the market share of the space. Really, raise the issue of uh, the monopoly power. So this is the one uh, reason why. Uh, China take a, a really um, very aggressive approach uh, towards regulating these companies. The other uh, key aspect is protecting data privacy and uh, and data security. Right. So uh, because of the data collected, um, um, private, um, you know, life of uh, many many uh, citizens. Um, so to what extent that uh, the individual uh, privacy can be protected here, and also. Uh, once these companies are listed in foreign exchange market, uh, to what extent that uh, some of the data uh, will be surrenders uh, to the regulators uh, of these foreign exchange. So, so that actually also raised the, the issue of a national cybersecurity concern. I think that, that is the reason uh, why uh, the, uh, the Chinese authorities have become much more cautious about uh, having these companies listed in foreign exchange uh, market. And uh, um, if you look at uh, what China has been doing with uh, the uh, big data company here, it is actually uh, a global trend. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not just a challenge for Ch Chinese government, but also uh, this is a challenge for other government as well. Um, if you look at the you know, last two or three years, um, you know, companies, uh, big data companies like uh, uh, Facebook, like Amazon, Google, uh, has been, you know, encountered significant difficulties, and and also, uh, you know, government in uh, across the world uh, have been also taking regulatory actions against these companies. Uh, there are significant fine uh, has uh, been charged, and then also uh, there are, you know, a new policy has been established by a different company towards uh, their operation. Um, one of the differences between those type of regulation and the direct approach adopted by the Chinese government is that uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, for example, the stock price of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Facebook and now Meta, right? Um, that you know, there's up and down of the company's uh, the market uh, uh, size, uh, 
the 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 uh, the overall price uh, fluctuated um, from year to year, but but overall, if you look at it, it's it's still continue to grow uh, as, as compared to uh, many of the uh, tech company in China. The stock has uh, been really uh, significant reduced, and uh, and there's no you know such uh, continuing growing uh, sign. And uh, Aside from the two aspects that I mentioned, what are other aspects that uh, the China wants to uh, uh, impose more restrictive regulations on the uh, big tech here? Uh, Professor Tsai already mentioned earlier about uh, the desire to shift uh, from consumer internet to towards the hard tech. This is one of the strategic uh, uh, direction that the, the Chinese government would like to take um, to really have a more resources and the, in the, in the talent uh, to be concentrated on the hard tech areas, semiconductor, battery, industrial internet, um, biotech, and so on and so forth, and the light on consumer internet. So, so those are uh, the, the kind of strategic move made by the Chinese government and the regulation actually have to achieve that. And uh, the other aspect is to serve the public interest um, by curbing uh, so-called uh, irrational expansion of market or barbaric growth of capital, right? So what they meant by that is that there are certain aspects of the, the development of high tech actually uh, uh, have led to uh, certain undesirable um, undesirable consequences from society perspective here. For example, uh, you know, young people are focusing or, or spend too much time on gaming. And, and also, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the prevalence of uh, um, the for-profit uh, tutoring, uh, families spend too, a lot of money uh, on the tutoring service, and that actually can have a potential negative impact uh, on the population. Policy. So, so basically, uh, this is uh, uh, to uh, using the regulation as a way uh, to uh, uh, to fulfill the social policy objective. This is another aspect. But I want to raise some of the potential concern. Right, uh, there are, you know, uh, very the very reason why uh, Chinese government uh, decided to, to take a very strict regulate approach towards uh, a high tech. But what are the, some of the negative consequences here? One of the aspects uh, is uh, the consequence towards uh, uh, talent development uh, in the technology development and the entrepreneurship here. So, so this, uh, you know, uh, the big tech companies actually uh, remain the backbone uh, and the source of vitality of China's uh, economic growth and provide job opportunity to well-trained and hardworking young people. Um, so this can have a massive impact on employment and the expertise uh, development here. So uh, these companies are, you know, based on some observers are no longer people's first choices for job. And some people would now prefer to work for state-owned enterprise or for the government uh, instead of working for the um, tech company. Um, the worst outcome is that the crackdown can uh, killing the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial drive uh, that made China a tech power and the destroyed job that used to attract countries brightest. And the one other area of concern is whether or not China can remain uh, its edge in AI, uh, um, the artificial intelligence research and application. Yeah, if you look at uh, the global distribution uh, of uh, where the power line and the, where the development line, you, you know, China actually have a significant advantage in this regard. Uh, one of the reasons in the past is uh, that uh, China have uh, uh, adopted a pretty a practical approach to uh, data pr protection and and, uh, and so forth. So, um, so that's why uh, you know many companies and uh, are able to use significant amount of uh, the data uh, to do AI research and researchers I also benefit from that. So, so that you know when you switch um, to a very strict um, data protection regime, uh, to what extent the, the China can continue. Uh, to sustain its competitiveness. This is open to question. And the other issue is about uh, uh, the global expansion of uh, tech giant uh, from China. If you look at uh, 
uh, DD's uh, world operation here. Um, in many aspects, uh, DD has already uh, competing uh, with Ubers in, in many markets here. They have, really have a global aspirations uh, of expanding to many places in the world. It's uh, the same uh, situation with, uh, um, with ENS Group. Um, if you look at uh, uh, the Alibaba's um, the expansion it has already been expanded to many different parts of the world, and uh, uh, the ends groups also have made significant global uh, investment here. So um, this really uh, this this regulation really can have a significant impact on future growth of this company in the global stage. You know, we look at the, these internet companies; they uh, it is still at the beginning uh, of the overall development here that. You know, many uh, company, uh, company from outside uh, China may take the places uh, of the likes of Ants Group and uh, DD um, to have their global uh, expansion. Uh, if if uh, you know the regulation have a significant negative impact on uh, the growth of these Chinese company, right? So uh, this also have a uh, can potentially have a significant development overall in terms of. Uh, uh, the, the China's development uh, in terms of startup and the and the global unicorn. If you look at the, the current situation here, that you know the China uh, has been considered as the leader in e-commerce, mobile payment, and, and a lot of different areas here, and uh, have a significant presence uh, in terms of percentage of global unicorn. Uh, to what extent that the regulation uh, will uh, put some potential negative impact on this part of development. Is also open to question, and the other aspect would be the soft power of China. If you look at how popular uh, the TikTok is across the different country here, right? This is actually a significant uh, value for China in terms of soft power because of uh, the branding recognition here. So um, you know, this is of course uh, the uh, benefit significantly from uh, the significant growth of the uh, the internet companies in China. Uh, to what extent the regulation again? Uh, have any negative impact on the development of soft power for China um, is also uh, a potential concern. So the regulatory agency actually have a significant uh, um, challenges here. The, the, the challenge is to balance different uh, policy objective in regulating big tech here. So on one hand, that you would like to sustain growth of investment into the tech sector. You want to promote uh, innovation entrepreneurship. But at, uh, on the other hand, you want to protect the consumer from uh, predatory practice, uh, from monopolistic power of big tech, improve um, protection of data privacy and data security, and also serve social policy objective here. Uh, these are you know, many different objectives here, and uh, they point to different direction here. How to balance these different objectives would be a key challenge for uh, the regulatory agency here. So the regulatory capacity um, um, raised uh, a question, right? And, and if you look at uh, the performances of the, these regulatory uh, measures so far, um, you know that indicate uh, the regulation of big data is the new air area for all countries. No country really can provide good experiences for China to learn from, right? The China uh, is a pilot this uh, uh, new areas, and uh, and they would have to actually uh, spend significant efforts in in, in doing that. And if you look at current practice, the rush to regulate China's big tech has led conflict among different agencies, right? There are uh, different aspects uh, needs to be regulated, um, financial aspect, and also the data governance aspect, and also the, uh, uh, you know, the, the aspect of IPO in the uh, foreign market. Those are required different uh, uh, efforts here, and the uh, and four, on the territory of a different agency here, but how do how would you uh, coordinate among those different agencies uh, is a significant challenge here. And uh, if not coordinated well, uh, this can lead to so-called a regulatory competition. Right? The opening of the regulation to uh, tech sec um, actually made it particularly tempting for the Chinese government official uh, to just for a seat in, at the table. Um, so, so far, uh, regulation has led to a very high level of uncertainty about development of high tech. This is actually uh, can be quite, uh, uh, have a negative impact on the future growth here. So um, one, one of the um, potential outlook uh, for what might happen in the future uh, is uh, 
that what has happened before uh, in the regulation of other industry uh, in China, which is uh, to swing between the two extreme uh, situation. One is losing to the point of chaos. And then uh, if you start to control with command control regulation, then you would lead to the situation of controlling to the point of death. This is the best summarized by uh, Chen Yun, right? the, um, the former, you know, uh, uh, the leading government official in charge of uh, economic affairs, and uh, and uh, and he basically summarized the regulatory approach in China um, by you know using this uh, uh, this uh, four four different phrases here, right? So so it's basically you know the, the government keeps shifting between the two extremes here. That that also uh, can be quite a negative outcome uh, overall. So like I mentioned before, as a policy scholar, I like to uh, provide uh, uh, some of the policy uh, implication uh, of uh, what uh, I observed uh, as a consequences of uh, the, the regulatory approach, uh, approach to the high tech. Uh, one is to strengthen regulatory capacity. There are you know, new challenges uh, with overwhelm um, any regulatory agencies of any countries, right? So for China uh, to, uh, to do it well, uh, you, it, it has to strengthen the regulatory capacities. The second is to use the regulatory impact assessment or cost benefit analysis to, and to assess economic efficiency, right? Because uh, there are pros and cons of these regulation here. And that at the end of the day, what would be the net economic consequences of the regulation here? This is what we have to adopt evidence-based approach by looking at uh, various uh, for negative or oh, various of uh, you know the benefits uh, against the various of costs, and to look at uh, whether or not those regulation produce uh, net economic gain uh, for the country overall uh, over the long run, and then explore a range of policy instrument beyond the command control regulation. Here, right now, regulation seem to be the answer to many of the questions, uh, many of the unanswered issue here. But there, there are a lot of other instrument that government can employ. And also use smart regulations, right? Um, if you look at uh, uh, the businesses, they are big data company here. And the big data can be also used by the government uh, to engage uh, smart regulation here. This is another uh, aspect that the government can, can try. And the last point is to employ different policy instruments for different policy objective here, right? If the goal is to, to achieve a common Prosperity, um, maybe that uh, you know the income redistribution policy uh, is a better choices uh, to 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 uh, uh, to deliver that policy objective instead of using regulation uh, for the industry specific industry uh, to achieve that. Okay, so I will uh, end my uh, sharing now. Um, get yeah. back to you, uh, Donna. Mm, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, you very right directly towards the annex. Uh, address the question of how we can address different policy goals uh, using different policy instruments. It doesn't have all have to be conflated uh, under a drive for common prosperity or, or whatever. So uh, uh, last but not least, it uh, gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Ruben uh, to, to give us his comments and his uh, comparative perspectives on China and Russia's tech, uh, tech uh, industries. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I, uh, indeed, I wanted to, to try to, to stress the crack approach of comparative studies of <laughs> economics and focus actually on comparing um, uh, the Russia and China, actually not only in tech, I would, uh, uh, but more generally, uh, and also actually uh, addressing uh, whether the, uh, the curbing of capitalism is something that we see in Russia today as well, uh, because uh, actually if you look at the moment, uh, one, Obviously, the most salient, important point that you just see in the news is that currently a lot, currently a lot of uh, policy and economic issues in Russia are discussed in the shadow of geopolitical tensions that are rising, uh, and currently they're being like basically at the pinnacle of extreme, uh, like of of, uh, of tensions with uh, both with uh, with US and NATO, and but that actually kind of stresses that uh, interesting point that in Russia basically the regulation and approach to like digital new technologies and more traditional sectors of the economy they're very different, and if you look at the more traditional uh, sectors of the economy there you see like a, at least a movement towards more involvement of state 
and uh, a higher intervention of state, although it's already kind of like state capitalism with a very high uh, role of, uh, of uh, state. It goes even like to higher, higher levels, partly for two, I, basically in my mind, like for, for two reasons. One is that actually uh, is basically socioeconomic because during the pandemic crisis, the issues of inequality uh, became even more Kind of salient in Russia, uh, as as almost I think like it's it's a standard thing in all all the, the world that uh, COVID crisis was um, disproportionately hitting more vulnerable uh, popula population. Uh, but at the same time, you see that if you look at the multi like like really like Forbes list of, uh, of Russia millionaires, they actually they they, they were doing pretty well <laughs> during during this crisis. So some of this. Increased intervention of the state are driven by this. So there was a, a hike uh, in the in the tax burden, for example, metal uh, producers, uh, which was pretty unexpected, pretty heavy. Um, there was also um, uh, some regulations that basically even more clo uh, led to even more um, uh, restrictions on international trade. Uh, and that actually, th this is uh, some of the information in the recent years. Partly also for geopolitical regions that are, Russia was moving into more uh, autarkic is like a bit overstatement, but more kind of uh, oriented to, towards in, uh, internal consumption, uh, or at least with trade when it was trade more uh, oriented to the Asian economies and China in particular, again for geopolitical reasons. But this year there was some uh, some kind of. Uh, unpleasant for business developments uh, that uh, were um, leading to even more restrictions on this. For example, um, there were basically the uh, as a reaction to to price uh, hikes in both as an, in metal, uh, it, it led to increase in tax burden. For example, in agricultural products that led to imposition of of uh, pretty uh, significant expert duties or quotas for agricultural production, which was actually very negatively uh, kind of uh, perceived by business because uh, because obviously that was for Russia, it's like as an expert of agricultural products and um, and related products was a very, it's actually kind of grow, was very growing, one of the very actively growing um, uh, areas where the international trade was increasing, so that was a, a kind of unpleasant set of uh, of, um, uh, of kind of development in state increasing its intervention, uh, and starting the, actually this uh, this month, starting from January, actually there was a it was kind of not that old, that salient, but very very uh, important increase in the costs related to labor mobility. Uh, Russia introduced that, and it's it basically it's very close to like non-tariff barriers in trade. It's like non-tariff barriers in labor mobility, <laughs> because Russia actually introduced without without officially changing policy, it introduced very very burdensome medical exams for all for foreign workers, that actually in the end um, uh, kind of implicitly uh, aim at uh, reducing labor uh, mobility, which is a very actually in my mind very kind of dangerous. Policy, because uh, for demographic re uh, reasons, actually, the working population of Russia in the longer term, uh, because the working population in Russia is decreasing, and that is a kind of it's a, it's a significant worry for the pace of the economic growth. So, uh, and it was uh, in previous years um, uh, that was uh, compensated by increasing migration, predominantly from Central Asian uh, republics. Uh, so, introducing all these extra barriers. It actually may, combined with demographic problems, may have very significant negative effects, in my view. But uh, uh, for the future economic development, so they are more likely. So the the part of it is uh, explanations are more like political because uh, there is a social issues, a lot of social problems related to like uh, to work migrants, as is is in most uh, countries, and in this sensitive period of uh, of post crisis, uh, that may kind of play the role. Uh, 
what is uh, a bit again more worrying for me is that part, at least based on the rhetorics and like informal talks with the representatives of government they seem to be thinking that the russian economy went very well from the covid crisis and in my mind that is a kind of a questionable statement uh because if you look at the numbers russia dealt uh, with it uh kind of okay it was uh if you look at only economic numbers so if you if you look at the reduction of gdp it was basically kind of world average slightly better than uh, advanced countries which russia usually compares itself with um but actually future prospects are not that great and um uh if you look at the particular policies that were implemented, I think, like, to a large extent, they like exactly the opposite of Chinese policies. It was very loose policies, and basically, in terms of uh, when there was a trade-off between restrictions on business and uh, and um, slowing down the pace of the uh, spread of infection, it was clear that Russia all the time was making decisions that were more uh, related to uh, to loosening. The restrictions and help like kind of not putting extra burden in business but that pay uh, that we clearly see the price of it uh in terms of excess deaths uh, uh if you look at it like by now by all accounts it's more than one million people where for us it's, it's a lot uh if you look at the per capita that's uh, among all the or basically advanced countries uh, that that will be one of the highest levels so in some sense it's clear that in uh, in terms of uh, of going through the crisis the russian government made a decision like a deliberate decision in the trade-off between medical consideration and economic consideration to lean more on economic consideration than me medical even with this the the um the effect on the economy was pretty big and as i said like basically world average so calling it a you know success is a is a questionable statement um and but that actually this the perception of this as a success is one of the reasons why they think that now they can reduce more restrictions and the economy still will do well because they have extra um extra capacity which again in my own view is a very questionable and pretty kind of Honestly, like a dangerous from the long-term perspective of the economy uh, set of, uh, of events. Uh, but that is, if we like, that's if we talk more about the traditional economy. There, you see this increase in state stent interaction. Everything is basically all the worries are about now geopolitical tension, etc. The situation is very different if we move to to start looking at the digital technologies and how it's um, the. Uh, the types of regulation that government is adopting there, especially if you compare it exactly with the recent developments in China. Because basically, if you look at it, uh, then the digital sector is one of the, uh, one of the most successfully growing sectors in Russia. Uh, and partly it is uh, actually uh, can be attributed for, for, se for to several uh, actually fundamental uh, strong points that Russia uh, had a, a, a education system that was actually kind of inherited from Soviet Union. It was very much uh, stressing the technical skills uh, uh, and basic STEM skills that, that became very relevant in digital technology. So there was a like, human capital capacity. Or, uh, and also, um, it turned out that basically, kind of, I think that the Russian market size of market was, uh, you know, Midway, so it's sufficiently big to develop local players, and not as huge as, like, for example, like Chinese market to make it like a really valuable uh, kind of market for really big big um, players that try to lobby opening the market. So in Russia, it was a, a, a situation in which, if you look at well, if you call like platforms or eco ecosystem, like really big digital uh, players, they are dominated by local players. But without, not because of strict restrictions like in China, there's like Google can operate in Russia. It just, it loses half of the market to a local company, Yandex, just because of a combination of, uh, uh, of local knowledge of the local players, this uh, said like human capa capacity and um, uh, that, that is uh, there. Um, and uh, some, again, uh, some uh, specific understanding uh, understanding of of um, uh, you know how it works in Russia, you have to under, like uh, this local knowledge is often missing for uh, for foreign players. Begin the outcome is that without strong barriers to entry, 
uh, still this market is dominated by local players. And what's also very different uh, for, uh, for Russia, if you look at this digital tech giants, is that at least two of the main players, they are kind of developing from traditional banks. One of the most developed ecosystem in, in, in Russia is based on Sberbank, which is the, the main bank in Russia. And that is different. I mean, we don't see this happening in, any, in other countries with the, the, the tech data dimes growing from traditional banking. And that actually um, has uh, important implications for a regulatory environment because basically currently, partly because of this, but the, the main agency that regulates all digital like kind of uh, ecosystems is the Central Bank of Russia. Uh, it's like a mega regulator, so it regulates not only banks but other like financial etc. issues. In the end, it turned out to be that all like uh, the strategy in regulating all the digital big digital companies is in the central bank of Russia. And central bank of Russia, I said, it's probably the most uh, kind of technically advanced and the most professional government agency in Russia. So in the end, they made it, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, type of regulation, they, I think they manage actually for now, at least again, and it's Russian, you, know, you always have to be like for now, at least for now, it's, uh, it's uh, pursuing um, a regulation for like some mid middle way in which exactly it's, it's I think it's exactly fits that it's not loosening to the point of chaos and not controlling it to the point of death. <laughs> so so uh, there are regulations uh, that, which was all like naturally arising. They were not in, immediately implemented. Like a lot of it, what we see in China is that uh, what's troublesome is that pace of change in which uh, the regulation was suddenly uh, increased um, and uh, suddenly introduced in many, many, many uh, sectors. And Russia was building up uh, slowly, but deliberately. And so far, actually, the approach, and I've, uh, I, when I, I was participating in discussion in Central Bank on Russia, now in Parliament of Russia about the development, they are, they're uh, unusually for Russia. They, 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 they think that the regulations should, uh, they, one of the main concerns is not to over-regulate this market. Exactly because it's one of the most successfully developing market in Russia, but at the same time addressing the issues of the very important issues, for example, of monopolization that were already raised and, 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 and privacy of data, data security, etc. But there, uh, but there, the approach is at least as of now. Uh, what we see is that um, it's uh, nobody's talking about forbidding uh, foreign players because uh, because um, there was kind of any attempts to dominate Russian market by foreign players basically was proved to be you know, unsuccessful so far. Uh, starting from Google losing, uh, not losing, but like kind of, uh, they are 50-50 basically uh, with the Yandex competing, even like with the taxi uh, services, Uber entered Russia and then it was bought off basically make a joint venture with Yandex. DD actually entered Russian market two years ago, but not particularly successful. And actually, the last week there were uh, there were um, there were basically news of them drastically reducing the number of employees. Well, partly, it probably reflects the general issues that DD is facing. But in particular, in Russia, it's obvious that it was one, just another case when the digital markets uh, entered of foreign players was not um, that successful. So in that sense, like they, there's no discussion of forbidding foreign players of playing because they are either form joint ventures or play still a marginal role. Um, there are no discussions about um, that actually happened like in Europe of breaking up uh, ecosystems and like using the you know old style anti uh, uh, antitrust approaches uh, because they actually understand that or because of the social uh, of uh, of uh, of network effects um, and uh, uh, the way the data is used actually the the monopolization growth of the systems are actually beneficial for consumers. So they are very careful not doing this. The approach for now is actually increasing competition, which is again, sorry, but it's like for me, it's very surprising when you're in Russia, you see you, you see that all the regulatory agencies think that the main thing is increasing competition. But that's actually kind of very different. What I said is digital 
industry is very different from all other uh, traditional uh, industries. So there, the discussion is mainly increasing competition, increasing competition on the platforms. And there was a reason, like, like I think this week, there was a settlement between antitrust agency and Yandex, this Russian, basically Google, of unfair competition on the platform. So th this is one imp important issue of competition on the platform. And in terms of competition between platforms and uh, competition between ecosystems, also the main discussion is to, to increase competition in terms of, and here we come to the, uh, to the issues of data portability, who owns the data consumers or ecosystems. And there the, issue, the discussion is back actually moving closer probably to the uh, to the um, approaches kind of like open banking system in in UK but uh, but learning from it and making it more like you know, more workable solution uh, and giving back the ownership of the data to consumers so that they can actually move their own data between uh, between eco, uh, kind of competing ecosystems or new entrants and by this, like increasing competition and addressing the issue of monopolization with this. On top of it, obviously, again, because of this um, specificity of Russian ecosystems, that one of the two main, um, one main ecosystem is built around Sberbound, another ecosystem, like, like I would say, like a wannabe ecosystem, is, a, is a VTB, another big, uh, big bank. <laughs> And Tinkoff, like it's another online bank, uh, the, the the role of banking regulation actually starts playing a, a huge role, because of the central bank, whether it puts barriers on them investing in other services that they want to develop, that becomes a huge issue. So far, again, there was like a, a, in the in summer or, or the previous year, there was a big open discussion of this in the central bank, made it clear that it's on its position that they will not forbid it, like. In, in a lot of uh, of countries, they won't put uh, like uh, binding restrictions, but they will introduce like what risk risk um, uh, weighted approach in which basically banks banks will have to make additional reserves if they want to invest in this all new digital services, which again seems to be this middle uh, uh, middle ground. Um, and uh, well, basically summing up, like I want to want to say, if you contrast especially Russia and China. Uh, that uh, this Russia is, operates under this kind of, you know, I would say like a basically two speed economy, uh, in which there is like basically most most of the most of the uh, economy is dominated by traditional industries, in which the involvement of states is very huge and actually growing, and a lot of it is actually um, driven by in the in this last year was driven by political considerations. Uh, as you probably know, there were like uh, internal politics in Russia became even more uh, strict, uh, starting like last January, when it started with, um, with the return to Russia, with, um, with like, opposition leaders, Navalny, it's imprisonment, et cetera. So it became much stricter uh, and it increased the regulation by the government in terms of internal politics is actually very important because uh, for the last like couple, that like, Two decades, basically at the top, there was always like this counterbalance of people who were more for like liberal wing of the government was for putting economy first, and like more you know security based uh, wing, and currently because of the this is last uh, I think last year pretty clear that the kind of the eco pro economy liberal wing is um, became basically marginalized. And all the main calls are made at the second wind, uh, and that like in 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 politics and security issues, but actually obviously it spills off to economy as well. Uh, so in general, in 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 kind of ninety percent of the Russian economy, that is the tendency of a higher increase in, in involvement of state, um, more barriers to to international trade, basically closing down, etc., which is very contrast with the small but most vibrant part of the economy of digital economy in which kind of it's in many respects it's 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 very close to kind of uh the regulation that achieves exactly this middle way of not, uh, avoiding both chaos and death and in that's why it's one one of the most kind of actively growing areas in russia again partly you can ex potentially explain it with political Kind of uh, issues that it's actually supported because it's a kind of, you know it's a safety valve in which the most educated, highly educated, most kind of active youth um, members that uh, are potentially politically most troublesome uh, uh, strata in society. They this is a place where they all go 
because there they actually it's a, it's the most uh, you know actively growing uh, uh, a sector of economy where actually they can they use their talents and uh, be busy and not going on the streets of France. Uh, so that's uh, as usual. It's like politics and economy like, hi highly intervene, but that is I think like my, my, what is interesting and compared like with um, the, the Chinese way and the Russian way is like the Russia, a lot of ways is actually very similar to what's going on. China in terms of state involvement and politic, politics playing a huge role. But in Russia, then, then you observe this two-speed development over digital part of economy and traditional part of economy. Uh, so thanks a lot. That will be kind of my approach to trying to uh, compare the situation in Russia and China recently. Thank you so much, uh, Ruben. I think the last bit on how big tech or the digital economy represents a bright spot uh, in, in, in Russia is really very interesting, right? Uh, in most countries, we struggle with big tech all wanting to go into finance, disintermediating banks, disrupting the financial system, potentially causing financial instability, becoming data monopolies. Uh, it seems in, Russia case, in Russia's case, it was the banks that created the digital ecosystem. And so the regulatory authorities have always had the practice of you know, how do we regulate them intelligently, professionally, in a way that you know, balances across uh, the different policy objectives uh, that Shun was talking about. So that's a really interesting case study. I don't think it's been observed anywhere else in the world. Anywhere else in the world, it seems to be big tech encroaching into the very complex uh, space that finance occupies. And creating all sorts of regulatory issues and problems, and 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 in jurisdictions like China's, uh, where regulatory capacity is relatively underdeveloped, you know they struggle mightily with how quickly uh, big tech is, um, you know, expanding and moving into areas that uh, the cyberspace regulators may not traditionally be familiar with. So it seems, for some reason, for some quirk of history, Russia seems to have avoided uh, that problem. Uh, we've got some questions on the Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes more for questions. So I'm going to circle back to the rest of the speakers as well. And Ruben, please feel free to join. Uh, there was a question on how long should we expect this regulatory uncertainty in China to last? Is it going to be short term or do we expect it to be more medium term uh, phenomena? Also, I'll add on to that question by saying it's not just regulatory uncertainty. It's also this tendency to ideologize and moralize very complex uh, issues, right? For instance, every time the Chinese regulator talks about disorderly expansion of capital or refers to gaming as spiritual opium, I mean, that kind of, it's not, it's not you know, it unnecessarily uh, simplifies uh, a, very com a very complex set of issues. And, and that doesn't help with creating uh, regulatory predictability and giving you know, the market signals of where the state wants to go. Uh, but so Albert, uh, Kelly, or, or, or Shun, how would you respond to that set of questions? I'll take um, a quick, oh, sorry, Albert, you can go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Kelly. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> I think I'm of two minds about this because on the one hand, um, a lot of people in my field, political science are saying, okay, we just have to make it to the 20th party Congress. And then after November, once she's consolidated his third term, things should calm down and then maybe we'll, We'll be able to identify some defining characteristics of what the next um, several years will bring. But at the same time, um, the current leadership has already demonstrated uh, certain characteristics that are that are quite distinct and different from previous ones, and that includes this incredible um, revitalization of ideology, the centrality of ideology, and um, strengthen party strengthening. That is different from before, actually. And it's not just in SOEs um, and, and um, government civil servants who have to do the Shueshi Changguo uh, patriotic app um, and log in a certain number of hours. I mean, it's uh, building party cells. That, that was indeed intentional to address an earlier question that you mentioned. People all over China are spending more time on ideological work than ever before. It's in, it's in firms, it's in higher ed, it's in, it's really quite ubiquitous and um, and it's serious. This is uh, they they really need to they're required to do that. And I think this this is an outgrowth of uh, a genuinely changed approach to regime security. It's not just stability maintenance anymore. Um, now the term is proactively preventing risks and economic governance has shifted to focusing on threat prevention to make sure it doesn't lose control of the private sector and they need to be reined in when they go on reckless spending sprees and take on too much debt 
and political fealty, I think, is also turbocharged. And the piece about, um, it, to the extent that ideology remains really, you know, solidified, and um, that that may be a source of continuity. And to bring it back to common prosperity, one of the definitions of common prosperity includes um, a spiritual and uh, what, spiritual something. It's it sounds odd in English. <laughs> a, a spiritual and civilizational kind of um, health, right? And that I think that's where we get to, you know, crackdowns on social influencers and you know certain styles of. Um, celebrities and and that sort of thing so if that if that continues then that's not necessarily uh, economically rational you know it's not antitrust data protection i mean that's all rational um but this is more of a cultural preference than an ideological preference right hmm. thanks very much Kelly. Uh, albert um well one thing i should say there are many policies in many countries including the u.s recently that are not economically rational especially the tariffs on China, I mean, which we know that U.S. firms and consumers are bearing the entire cost of it, which is crazy. And the new administration has not reversed one step. So there are many things that go into these directions. I think it's very hard to say uh, it, when things will end or change. I kind of feel like um, from the economic standpoint, the economy is not going to tank. The economy will still grow at a modest rate. Uh, there's a lot of growth momentum in the, I mean, you know, we talk about what's in the news and in the high tech issues are, are particularly prominent. But, you know, if you go around China and visit firms that I've, you know, which I've had a chance to do doing a lot of firm service, in China, there's an enormous amount of innovation and uh, enormous amount of competitiveness in a lot of the supply chains in China. Uh, China has lengthened its share of global supply chains um, in recent years, which has mean that they're uh, capturing more of the value added. They're becoming much more sophisticated and they're, they're very competitive in many sectors. So those are not, many of those sectors are not ones we hear a lot about, but it's vast. I mean, uh, and so I kind of feel like, uh, you know, the, the, the government, China is gonna become a developed country. It's gonna grow, certainly grow fast enough to do that. It's not gonna fall into, an, a, you know, the middle income trap that people are worried about. And it's hard for the government to mess that up uh, although I think there are many lost opportunities in terms of maximizing growth in China and having a very robust, especially having a very robust private sector led e uh, economy. Uh, so I'm kind of cautiously optimistic still, despite all of these headwinds. Um, and I also think back to the whole, you know, crossing the river by feeling the stones. I think the government still has a level of pragmatism. There's a lot of ideology now, I think, certainly, but uh, when uh, when they when when they, it's clear that there are some very large economic costs to things they're doing, I think they will tend to steer back, and uh, so they'll kind of muddle their way through uh, in a way that's probably going. Uh, it's, there's going to be a lost a lot of lost opportunity, but there's unlikely to be a catastrophic drop e either. But you don't fundamentally disagree that the. You know, uh, the regulatory uncertainty may, may last quite a while. That oh yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Ashun or Ruben, would you like to chip in? Yeah, in, in, in Russia, I think like the, he, he, in in horizon the horizon when it ends is even harder to predict than in China. In China, at least you have this. Uh, like salient moment in Russia, the most officially the most salient moment is like twenty twenty four. Uh, with the last presidential elections. But again, you know, as in all this uh, politics, it, it, it starts much earlier than that. So uh, I think currently, the um, in terms of internal politics, I think that basically now everyone is focused in the last, I think, month, everyone is focused on the in external relationships, uh, the potential conflict with Ukraine. The, then what happened in Kazakhstan was like a big shock, but also like it's a wake up call that actually there are a lot of different issues. And I think like for China, it's also important that like, you know, the Central Asian region is actually like, we have to pay very close attention to what's going on there. It's, uh, it will can play 
uh, a huge role. So I think like um, in terms of like internal politics in Russia, it's now basically more like looking outside what's going on and what will happen potentially in Ukraine, potential sanctions, etc. I think that becomes like like the dominant issue, and uh, I would expect that this at least this uh, these tensions they will have to lead one way or another in the next month or so. They will be re resolved one way or another because uh, there yeah. is a serious probability of like a military um, intervention by Russia, but then basically even by uh, you know, weather conditions, it will happen either like in the next well, month or so, or it will be then like basically it will, it will not happen. So uh, again, internally, it's less uh, from point of internal politics, less clear, there's no focal point. Mm -hmm. Externally, like I think the next month, month and a half will be extremely important. Mm. Thanks, Ashun. Yeah, I, I, I think that that kind of uncertainty may uh, last for a while simply because uh, it really takes time to develop uh, this kind of capacity um, for for right regulation here. And uh, the other thing, uh, the reason why it actually may take longer is that uh, it seems like a lot of policy choices are being uh, polarized very quickly. And uh, once it become polarized, it's a very difficult. Uh, to really, you know, to further seeking middle ground and try to uh, try different approach and so forth. Yes, I think that's that's actually I've, I've seen uh, that more now uh, compared to before, where you know a lot of policy actually uh, we ex you know experience significant debate and a lot of pilot being conducted, different opinion being expressed on them. Then uh, even after they uh, roll out nationally, there's still a significant debate so still can. Continue. I think that's uh, that actually I I see quite different uh, kind of uh, arrangement uh, than that than, than uh, the today. And the, the other aspect that I wanted to point out is that uh, I also agree with uh, uh, Albert that um, at the end of the day they might actually take a more pragmatic approach uh, because uh, if you look at uh, the switch to uh, from the uh, consumer tech to the hard tech, uh, the the uh, uh, the the underlying mechanisms um, for innovation and entrepreneurship essentially is the same, right? Because if you destroy the mechanism um, for these high tech, uh, the, these big tech and, uh, and these uh, consumer tech, then uh, much of the ecosystem, the incentive structure for the, uh, the, the hard tech uh, also uh, will go with it. So, so I think that they would uh, probably realize that soon. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the two things have to go hand in hand together. Hmm. There was another question on uh, on bubbles, right? Could it be that the Chinese state was just acting preemptively to prick uh, financial bubbles, property bubbles, even a tech bubble which the US had uh, in the early 2000s, in the late 1990s? So, so you know, seen from that perspective of preemptive, uh, you know, solving of problems, pre preventing bubbles from getting too large, uh, maybe those regulatory crackdowns weren't so bad after all whether it's in property or in tech. <laughs> Maybe should, they should have come sooner. <laughs> well, I'm not a big believer in the bubbles. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in China, there's always been speculation that there's going to be a financial collapse because the bubble is going to burst. And we've never seen it in 30 years. And I think the government has too many policy levers and also in, in the real estate sector, if there's any bubble, it's been the housing price bubble. Yeah. Uh, you know, the stock market is still a pretty small share of the whole overall financial yeah. system in China. And it's been more rebound and, even before the recent crackdown. The stock market hasn't yeah, yeah. been. So, uh, and and in, in the housing, you know, it's not a very highly levered uh, housing market in the sense that, you know, uh, the, depo the down payment rates are really high. The, there's not there, and the government has so many ways to recapitalize banks under financial stress, even Evergrande. You know, if the Chinese government wanted to, it could bail out Evergrande tomorrow, yeah. and then all these concerns would go away. But they don't want to because they're trying to, I mean, to their credit, trying to send a credible signal that they're not going to bail out big players and to try to induce more responsible. Uh, lending and to be more credible in that front because they they don't want I think they don't want to see prices go way up but to, even if prices go way up it doesn't mean that there's some huge bubble threat they can they have 
yeah, so uh, there's many, there's many uh, misunderstandings about how the Chinese economy works, I think, especially macroeconomic policy. You know, the, I was teaching a financial uh, economics class uh, in the business school, and then the students said, oh, China's debt to GDP ratio has reached X, you know, whatever, over 60%. Now it's high risk for, you know, you know to be financially fragile. And I, and I don't think that reflected a very those kind of rule of thumb based indicators are really are, are are not telling you what's really going on. There's no way that the Chinese central bank would yeah. uh, let, let that happen. There would be no banking crisis. So, yeah. uh, so I think um, it really reflects more um, not a, not a desire. And why would you want to preemptively prick a bubble anyhow? I mean, what what does that mean? I mean, we know we never know when bubbles <laughs> get in. So I yeah. So I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I think it reflects their their policy objectives at the in the current period. Mm -hmm. uh, Shun also mentioned uh, how issues which, you know, really ought, we ought to take, policymakers ought to take a technocratic professional approach, tend to get polarized very quickly and, uh, uh, and things then, you know, it's very difficult to take a rational approach. Zero COVID arguably is one of those. So there was a question about uh, to what, you know, what, what, would, what would the longer term if impacts of zero COVID, China's zero COVID policy be? on China's economic relations and trade with the rest of the world, particularly with the rest of Asia? Uh, Shun, you want to go ahead? Oh, Albert? Yeah. I, I can take that if no one else wants. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's, it really depends. I think it's unrealistic to have a zero COVID policy going forward because Everyone, you know, just listen to the scientists. They say COVID is going to be with us for a long time. And so it's unrealistic. And um, uh, I think it's a matter of managing uh, to, we have to see through and come to kind of a normal life with COVID. And I think China is trying to figure that out, but I think they're still intent on the zero COVID. I mean, in a more immediate term, I think if they are successful with the zero COVID policy, so they literally have very few cases or almost no cases, seems very hard, then it won't be so costly because people will still go around, they'll feel safe. But if, if they lose control and it starts to spread to 20 Chinese cities and their response is, okay, we're gonna stamp it out in 20 cities and we're gonna lock down 20 cities, of course, it will have a huge uh, economic impact. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure where that leaves us. I think it's, it's, it's pretty un uncertain. I think there's a yeah. large cost, obviously, to impeded mobility, international mobility over long periods of time. Yeah. We're seeing it in Hong Kong too, right? That there's really a lot of um, concern in the business community. Not just that it, uh, it has been very strict, uh, but that it's been strict for a long time. And now at some point, people start to uh, move or shift strategy. They're thinking more in the longer term and not thinking of it as a short-term thing. I think that's not the point where you want to get to. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. yeah, I think it's not just the fact that it's zero COVID and the strictness of it, but the fact that there is no end strategy, right? There's no exit strategy uh, from zero COVID that's causing a lot of businesses to rethink uh, how they should approach this. I think we are out of time, and I, I, I know I'm sorry that we've uh, lasted so long. And thanks to everyone who stayed on uh, for 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 this conversation. It's been a great conversation. I think it's been a great start to the Eurasia. Uh, business dialogue. I want to thank all our distinguished speakers, uh, particularly to Ruben uh, uh, for giving, giving us the uh, Russian-China comparative perspective. Uh, so thanks everyone for attending this uh, dialogue and I hope to see you at the next one. Uh, good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.